uh, we have with us Dr. John Stone from Edinburgh. Thank Hi. you for being here with us. We sure appreciate it, Dr. Stone. And um, we are going to be discussing FND, Functional Neurological Disorder. And we'd uh, like to remind everyone that's here with us today that if they have a question that they can ask uh, in the Q&A or they can also ask, um, they can raise their hand and we'll bring them over as a panelist and you can ask your own question. Um, at that time, you will be taken out of the webinar for just a minute and don't panic because you will be brought back in. We ask that if you do choose to ask your own question, that you, if you prefer that you turn off your video and um, your name will also pop up at that time. So if you'd like to just use your first name, uh, that would probably be best. So um, I think we can get started. So our first question was actually uh, right in to us. And the question they had was um, regarding the, um, uh, let's see, we have Sue. She has a 26-year-old daughter, has recently been diagnosed with FND, and cur currently she has seizures daily. She's wondering, how do we react to professionals when they insist that FND is purely a mental health illness? Yeah, so this is a very, this is a very common uh, issue, and... Oh, it's a difficult one because we we are dealing with a, a problem in FND that is is I think best described at the interface between neurology and psychiatry. There shouldn't really it's it's it, it's the reason it's so difficult is because all neurological conditions and all um, psychiatric conditions occur from the brain, and FND is a, is just a really good example of why we shouldn't really separate things out into psychiatric and neurological problems. The way things stand, um, they, the, the health professionals who say this is a mental health condition are technically correct because it's described within the um, psychiatric manual, DSM. Uh, but those of us in the field feel that it's better to think of it as a disorder at the interface between the two. I think the, the reason this has become such a problem is because when people hear the words mental health or psychological, their immediate reaction usually is to feel that they're being accused of making up these symptoms or doing it on purpose or faking them um, or that they're crazy. That's, that's usually, that's often what people feel or are made to feel by health professionals and that's just not the case. So if there's a way of getting around that problem so that everyone can agree this is a common condition in which the person suffers genuine symptoms, it's out with their control, they're not crazy, um, it's not all in their head, they can't just stop, stop doing it, um, then that is a way of moving things forward. And there are many excellent psychiatrists and psychologists who can help treat dissociative seizures. In fact, psychological therapy is the treatment of choice. Um, but it's, it's a difficult job sometimes just getting past that initial phase of everyone feeling got at or feeling that the seizures are um, being put on. So I hope, that, I hope that helps a little. Yeah, I think it does. And it also kind of plays into the next question that one of our viewers has asked. And they asked, do you think that lack of awareness by medical staff is a problem patients are that is causing them to be wrongly diagnosed and treated, and how can we be better informed? Or yeah, they be better informed? So there's several issues with, with misdiagnosis. So one is that patients with seizures, with dissociative seizures, for example, or functional movement disorders, are often mistakenly thought to have epilepsy or Parkinson's disease or MS, and so, sometimes for many years. And it's incredibly difficult if you've been given a diagnosis to discover that it's wrong and then you're not sure who to believe. And the other problem is that patients who have these conditions, when they're seen by health professionals, are sometimes, uh, sometimes overtly, the health professional will say, imply that they think that the symptoms are faked and that they're dealing with someone who doesn't have a genuine condition at all, that is just doing it for attention. Um, so that's another way in which 
diagnosis goes goes horribly wrong and you can imagine it's impossible to even begin thinking about treatment under those circumstances. I think you make some really good um, points there and, and I, I think that you know a lot of patients experience various degrees of, of that um, as well. Uh, <clears throat> do you want to say something? Else? Okay. Um, going on to another question that we had, uh, Barbara sent in. She says, I'm looking at FND as a description of symptoms instead of a diagnosis. Yes. Uh, do you think that some of that problem is some of the terminology that is used or lack of awareness? What do you think contributes to that? Yeah, so it's a good question from Barbara. I think people, many people, including health professionals actually, don't understand that this is not a dustbin diagnosis that you make just because someone has a, a neurological symptom like weakness or tremor or blackouts that you don't understand or because the tests are normal. That is not how you diagnose FND. You diagnose it by uh, finding clear positive features of the condition of FND. So if seizures and they have events where their eyes are tightly shut and the event goes on for 10 minutes and they're breathing fast and they're unresponsive and can't remember it. That is a dissociative seizure. There's really nothing else in medicine that produces that. Or if someone has a positive Hoover sign or positive entrainment test, that's how you diagnose it. So it's not a diagnosis of exclusion. There are problems with um, the word with the idea of symptoms and functional neurological symptoms and I, I this is something I struggle with because there are people out there who do have one or two symptoms and they're not really wanting to be labeled as having a disorder um, because they don't feel that their problem is that bad but there are other people where clearly they're very disabled and what they have is not just a symptom it's a disorder so we don't I don't think we've solved the problems with terminology. I think FND is a, is a step forward in the right direction that everyone uh, is beginning to sign up to, which is good. Um, but it's certainly not just a, it's not it's not a description of symptoms. And if, if anyone's out there feeling that they've been diagnosed in that sort of dustbin way and that they've just been told that this was the diagnosis because the tests were normal, they need to talk to their doctors and find out why they've made this diagnosis and ask them where are my positive signs of this condition great i think that's excellent advice and you know as far as in the terminology i know as as far as fnd hope we've really tried to advocate along with yourself and some other doctors that we do all get to a place of using the same type of terminology because it can be such um such a problem that you wouldn't really normally, I think, expect to have. We're going to kind of turn things into a, a different direction a little bit. This is a question we've never had before. Uh, we've got Jacqueline who asks, um, she was diagnosed with FND and she's very close to her due date. And she's just wondering if FND will affect her birth. What advice do you, do you give yeah. to her? This is quite a common question. I don't know what kind of symptoms she's got. Is it, do we know seizures or don't. disorder? No. Um, I think what's interesting about this is actually my, my experience of patients going through pregnancy and delivery is that I don't see FND causing a lot of problems around that time, certainly at the moment of birth. I think, I think what can happen for people who have seizures is that they might have a, they might have a seizure uh, during or after or particularly if they have a general anaesthetic, which can trigger dissociative seizures. Um, the main risk there isn't really from the seizure because the seizures, although they're unpleasant and for everybody and uh, are not actually dangerous at all, it's, it's the risk of health professionals um, overreacting to the situation. And for example, treating, the se treating a dissociative seizure, which is part of FND, as epilepsy and giving very strong drugs that are not required. Um, so that's the main problem that I end up talking to obstetric colleagues about in this, in this sort of area. Um, so as much as possible, if, if somebody, if the health professional looking after the FND or the patient himself can just almost prepare the, the obstetric staff, who really won't know anything, it's unlikely they'll know anything about this and just say, look, if I have a shake, if I 
blackout, don't worry, this, this happens to me a lot, don't panic, um, because it's the last thing you need at that time. I could see where if the nursing staff and people around you were not familiar with FND, how that could actually yeah. really complicate things by them um, being overly cautious, maybe in some respects, which I, you know, I hate to use that term, I guess, especially childbirth, but the, it could, I could see complicate things. Yeah, it's, an, I mean, it's, it, it's entirely understandable. If you've got staff there that are not neurologically trained, they're not really going to be, it's going to be very difficult for them to be confident that they are, that they're dealing with something which is not an epileptic seizure and doesn't require immediate treatment. Right. right. Well, and I think also, though, they may have to look on the other hand, too, that they don't ignore some of the other signs or symptoms if there is a problem. So I, I think just making everyone aware sounds like that is going to be the most important, that they understand the condition, they understand what's normal for you, and if anything yeah. else new arises, that they should then seek it out like they would Absolutely. anything else. And, and, uh, and it's possible that some people do have epileptic seizures at the time of delivery, so they have to be careful. Yeah, definitely. Great. Uh, the next question, we're kind of getting a, lot, a little variety here, but there's one particular question. This actually comes up quite often in some of the groups uh, dealing with relationships and FND. And Ashley writes in a, that she's currently going through a breakdown in her relationship um, and that every doctor that she has been to has been telling her um, partner that she's just under a lot of stress and this is the cause of all of her symptoms and all of the problems. And so uh, her partner fundamentally does not believe that there is a medical problem. And it's kind of creating some friction between the relationship. Can you give any, um, how, how, any advice on how to kind of deal with that? That's a very difficult one. I mean, if you've got a partner that doesn't believe there's any medical problem, then you can see why there's relationship problems. And I'm not, a, I'm not much good at relationship counselling, but I, I, I do meet partners where, and patients where that's the case. They tell me that their partner just simply doesn't believe them. They, the partner believes that they are faking their symptoms. And it's a clearly a really fundamental issue in terms of trying to improve um, improve that person's symptoms or access treatment if you've got if you're, they're living with someone who doesn't believe them um, how can you get better in that situation you do need people around you your friends and family to have some understanding of what's wrong so they can react in the right way and support you and encourage rehabilitation if they think there's nothing wrong with you where do you start with that um, if I, I would also, however, take, be, take issue with someone who makes a very simplistic um, relationship between someone's symptoms of FND and life stress that they have. We know that so patients who have F FND do have somewhat of an excess of life stresses, either current or in the past. But we also know that lots of them don't have those stresses and the and the amount of excess stress they have is not dramatic compared to many other common conditions so um, it, even when people have stress how do you know that that's you know that particular stress is the relevant one um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very rarely meet patients where I think oh that, that, that one stress is the is the sort of answer to their problem I think that's very simplistic and um, is a bit of a hangover from how these conditions have been thought of for a long time. So I understand where, where health professionals get that from, but I think we need to move along and get more complex in our views about this condition. I agree. You know, another question that's coming in that kind of looking at from a different, another perspective is this attendee is stating that her doctor has dismissed her after she's completed the week long physical therapy program. And she's not real sure how to handle this. And she wants to make sure that she continues to improve on her own. Um, what recommendation, re recommendations can you give uh, for at home treatment? Yeah, I guess that depends on the context. I mean, normally if someone has a week long uh, treatment program, if even if it's, if it's not gone well, you'd hope they would have input, they would have follow-up of some sort from a health professional 
uh, or further outpatient physio. It might be that there are some patients for whom physical therapy isn't helpful and or it makes them feel worse you know, and it's not the right time for them to be having treatment. So it's a bit difficult to answer that question. Uh, it depends how the week-long program went, I think. Um, do we know the answer to that? If, did, did it well, go well? I, I or did it... That it was fairly successful and I think that that's, right. you know, from the question, that's um, that they want to continue that success and continue right. to improve. Yeah, well, what we need, and we, we don't have it yet, and we, is, it's, it's difficult because I think the treatments that, well, that we know are, be, are beginning to work and we're feeling quite excited about in terms of physical therapy are, ultimately, they have to be individualized for the person. Um, there is, if anyone wants to see the kinds of things we're talking about, they can look at the uh, consensus physio treatment recommendations that Glenn Nielsen is the lead author on and I help with. And you can get those for free on the physiotherapy page of my website, Neuro Symptoms. It's, it's hopefully, it's not too much jargon, but you can see that the overall feel of it and, it, and uh, there's some of the detail there as well, depending on what symptom you have, if you have a weak leg or dystonia or tremor. Um, and there are some ideas there and on my site and, you, and, others, and your site too about individual treatments, but we, these are not easy things to do on your own. I would have hoped that during the treatment, the, pe the person would have been given some exercises to do um, and been helped to see their condition in a way that helped them move things forward. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that that is available on your website and it is also on the FND Hope website as well. In fact, our page was written by Glenn Nielsen and he there's some of the tips that are in the paper, and I believe that there's some on there as well that he added to it. So uh, it, great, great resources right there at our fingertips. And so um, make sure that we can take, everyone can take advantage of those. Uh, the next question we have is kind of going back to partners and um, a little bit. During a particular bad episode, should my partner go to the A&E or emergency room? Um, I've been told that they will supply, simply put her on a high dose of IV of benzo medication. Um, how can an FND patient receive proper care in an ER or A&E setting? Yeah, that's a very difficult one. It's a bit like the, um, the, the pregnancy one. I mean, the problem is if you, take, if you go to a, an emergency department with most of these sort of symptoms, it might be a seizure or paralysis you're going to encounter either, the chances are that you'll encounter a doctor who's very anxious about what's going on, thinks you're having a stroke or an epileptic seizure and is going to do lots of unnecessary tests. Um, or you, you may encounter someone who doesn't treat you very well or with respect. Now, that's not always the case. And there's plenty of, of examples where that doesn't happen. And, uh, but... Uh, for most patients, if you're having the, your normal kind of attack, even if it's really scary looking, if it's your normal attack and you've discussed it with a health professional in advance, usually I, it's better if you can not to, not to get emergency treatment because it doesn't normally help. And normally, as they say, you just put, fill it up with lots of sedatives. Now, I have to be very careful here not to, not to be saying to people, don't go to the emergency department. You know, I think you have to use your common sense. If you have a new symptom, um, then of course you've got to do what you think is safe. But I, I'm, I have many patients who find it helpful actually to be able to discuss this in advance with their neurologist or someone that's looking after them and, and talk through, well, what would I do if I had this happened? And if I have a seizure that lasts like, you know, is there any point ringing the ambulance? And usually the answer is no, there isn't because the person is not in danger they're not going to die, even nothing um, dreadful is going to happen. The worst thing that might happen is that they'll be very immobile and might need hospital care because of that. Um, but that doesn't necessarily need to happen as an emergency. So learning to manage these acute episodes and relapses at home is, is often part of treatment where that's delivered by someone who's got an interest in the condition. I we, we have this question that it comes up a lot within the Facebook pages and 
what you said is so important because it really does come down to people needing to make that decision with their healthcare professional that is familiar with their um, symptoms and what they're going through. And also, you know, everyone, that's a judgment call, I think, on your, on your own. It's not something that anyone else can really make for you. But I, I think you present some really good, helpful tips for, to help people kind of assess that situation. Uh, yeah, it's a sort of goal of treatment. So can I learn to manage these scary episodes on our own? Um, and often there's a feeling of achievement when you do that and, the, and you, you have an episode, you get through it, actually often not calling it, not having an ambulance involved or not having to go to hospital helps generally with the symptoms. And they often, the, you know, the whole episode or relapse may be a bit less severe, partly because you've um, helped, you've sort of learned to manage it differently. That's when Especially it well. if the patient has sensory type symptoms. I know a couple of people, you know, if sound and lights and things like that are, are a trigger for your symptoms, it's, it's definitely going to, you know, multiply that yeah. quite a bit. Uh, next question is from Paula. She says, uh, treatment after diagnosis seems to be inconsistent in areas. Uh, she was personally directed to the neurosymptoms website and left to deal with it alone. How do you go about requesting help? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really aware that, the, I mean, things are improving, I would say, particularly in the UK, but there's still most, in, in most centres around the world, this is not a condition that, that neurologists are that interested in, I think. Most, in most, you know, for most neurologists, they, they would recognise it, but they're not, they would not feel very, com very confident in explaining it and not feel confident in or feel that even if it was their responsibility to manage it. Now, I think that's wrong. I think we need to change that. And um, that's my view and, and many others. But unfortunately, the way things are, um, there are many patients with FND receiving poor treatment, I think, around the world. So I agree that if, if you just said, you know, here's your diagnosis, here's a website, off you go. Is not enough you know you can't that's a big website it's got lots of you know descriptions of all sorts of different things on it as has yours how do where did people start these things are these are resources of information to assist people they're not treatments in of themselves i think for most people so it's a case of trying if you can to find someone who, who wants to treat you and maybe insisting with your healthcare professional that you want to have treatment for your functional disorder. They may, one of, one of the reasons health professionals are reluctant is they don't, they, they, they're worried that they're going to upset the patient or the patient will be angry. And sometimes if they're met with a patient and say, look, I've got FND, please can you help me with this? Um, a lot of health professionals might be a bit, a bit it might help. So it's worth, it's worth thinking about that, changing the conversation. We, we found too that a lot of the apprehension is not that they don't want to help, it's that they, they don't have the tools. And, yeah. and I think, you know, one, sometimes helping them find the tools and bringing them to them, you know, we, there's some online things or the conference that we recently had, uh, there, there are some resources out there. So I think sometimes just kind of being patient with them as they're learning um, as well. I think that's great advice. And, uh, you know, saying to somebody, look, I've, I've got this problem. Can I, can you direct me to a physiotherapist who's got expertise in this condition? Or if you've got seizures, do you know any, uh, any, people, any therapists who've got experience of treating this? Cause I'd really like to meet one. Um, yeah, I think there's a there is a sort of lack of training in this area, and which and and many doctors unfortunately tend to think, well, I I don't really know about this. I'll, it's not really my problem. Uh, but actually, when they become interested and they know about it, they they it's actually rewarding for for doctor and patient. So it's a win-win, I think, potential out there. Definitely. A uh, question that was just asked is the brain rehabilitation unit in Edinburgh, is it a national unit or does it just serve Edinburgh? Yeah. Um, so this is a question for Scotland, really. We don't, there is a, there is a, uh, 
rehabilitation unit. I don't, that's, that, that's our neuro rehabilitation unit, which uh, is a national unit. But for functional disorders, um, we, in Edinburgh, we're able to see patients from Southeast Scotland. There's a neurologist, Dr. Murray in Glasgow, who sees patients uh, on the West Coast. And that we, have, we, we have a neurologist in, in, most, in, in all the four centres. So we don't have a specified national service as such. Um, I'm only able to see patients, NHS patients referred within South East Scotland usually. Well, and FND Hope is working with a couple other doctors as well to try to create a medical registry. And so I think it's important if you do have a doctor that is helpful, ask them to go to the FND Help website and sign up for that registry. Because a lot of times, there's a doc there really is a doctor close by. The other doctors just don't know to send them the patients yeah. their direction. So we're really trying to help coordinate some of that networking efforts. No, that's, that's yeah, and that's a, and that's a brilliant initiative. I'm really pleased that FND are doing that. I I'd, I'd wrestled with doing it for a long time, but I didn't. I it's I didn't want the, the sort of responsibility of getting it wrong or missing well, people out <laughs> and offending people. But so the fact that you. That, uh, that you're doing it is great, and uh, that would be a really great result, a great advance, I think, because as you say, that the situation's changed cons considerably. In the UK, we probably have about 10 or 12 centres now where neurologists are doing functional disorder clinics. That's that's up from 12 10 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so there's, you know, that's things have really improved. Well, and how many did we end up having at the international conference? Do you know the numbers offhand? So, so this was a um, yeah, this was a meeting that we had in uh, Edinburgh in September. It was for health professionals just to see where we were with the research in particular. And uh, sorry, excuse me. We had five hundred and sixty people come, um, wow. which was fantastic. I was hoping we might get two hundred and fifty, and we had five hundred and sixty multidisciplinary attendees from all over the world, five continents, lots of uh, physios, OTs, psychologists, neurologists, psychiatrists. Um, and it was a, I was really pleased with the positive atmosphere at that meeting, the fact that all over the, all over the world, uh, services are, are, are beginning, people are beginning to see that there is a new way to, to treat these disorders, a new way of thinking about them. Um, explaining them and getting you know getting patients better and uh and seeing that people become actually health professionals get very enthusiastic about this area when they start getting involved because they realize they can make a difference um so we just need to connect connect these health professionals with with the patients well we've got to keep expectations real we can't sort of we haven't got magic cures for this disorder but we do that the, that the treatments are helping a lot of people well, and, and I think it is positive to see so many that did show up. And, and I was um, fortunate enough to be able to go myself and to just see the positive, um, to see the positive influence that they were having on one another. And yeah. it, it, was, it was really great. Will the videos from that conference be available online? Yeah, so what we, we do have some films of the uh, speakers speaking. They don't have the, the actual slides in them, uh, but that's probably okay. I have to, we have to sort out what to do with that material in terms of permission from the speakers and um, have a think. Uh, we certainly want to make it available to all the people that were at the meeting and paid to register and things. We just have to be, we just have to think uh, about whether we can make that public or not. But all of the, um, I, th I think, I'm very keen for there to be a lot of transparency in all the research and uh, material that's come out. We, we edited a book last year, which is now available. Anyone with a university subscription, it's available. I hope at some stage we can get that book out there as well. Um, and, and a lot of the material, the research is coming through your site and other sites and my site as well. Um, so hopefully, I don't think, that, you know, it's, we're very keen as, as new develop, particularly treatments appear, that those will 
uh, those will be visible and not be sort of hidden behind paywalls and things. And that's, that'll be really helpful. Uh, one of the things I thought that was great at the conference is that it really touched on a lot of variability in the symptoms and some of the symptoms that we normally don't hear a lot about were actually talked about um, yep. amnesia for one. Uh, we've had some questions regarding that visual. Uh, how, how prevalent are those type of symptoms within? Yeah, so we had a lecture about uh, functional cognitive symptoms. So problems in thinking with concentration and memory, which I'd say are extremely common. I mean, I, they're so common, and particularly people with motor, functional motor disorders, that if someone hasn't got them, I sometimes wonder why not, because so many people have them. And we're talking here about things like um, having trouble remembering people's names, conversations, which is uh, some things that people have anyway, of course, but amplified and interfering with day-to-day -day life. It's an area that I'm, that I'm interested in. I think it's possible to identify functional cognitive symptoms in the same way that we do with other motor symptoms. People often worry that they're developing dementia because they can't remember things. And I think there are ways that we can uh, assess those symptoms to help people understand that they are part of FND and not, uh, and not, anything, and not something else. And then learn and help people a bit like we do with motor movements, motor problems. To I mean, one of the one of the core features of physiotherapy there is to help people understand that sometimes they think their brain is working too hard on the movements, um, and that's why it's going wrong. And the, and the physio is about allowing automatic movements to come back. And the same with cognitive symptoms. If you try, if your brain's trying too hard to do things, and you're you're uh, focusing your own attention on it because it's not working, then it works even less well. So what's an, uh, that's an area so, very interesting. Thing. So I just want to kind of add, you mentioned the dementia and um, cognitive. We've got a lot of people asking about a lot of various symptoms. Uh, would that also include, let's see, intermittent dilopia and hemifacial spasm? Uh, breathing difficulties would would those all fall into that same well there are there are many causes for that so so facial spasm for example has many causes although commonly actually facial spasm as a symptom is often part of a functional disorder uh, we recognize it's quite a common feature it's where people's mouth either go, perhaps I'll show you by the video either can go down like that with the lip sometimes going up or sometimes mm -hmm. it goes up like that and sometimes people's eyes become contracted like that. So persistent contraction like that is almost diagnostic of a functional movement disorder. Uh, uh, intermittent diplopia means double vision, which is also quite common. That's due to, um, as I, if I look at my finger and I bring it towards my nose, you can see I go a bit cross-eyed. And that's a, that's, a, that's a mechanism we all have. In someone with functional double vision, what's happening is that mechanism becomes overactive. So the one eye goes a bit cross-eyed all by itself and then you end up with double vision. That's called convergent spasm. And it's, a, again, a positive feature of FND. Well, thank you. We actually have a question now from one of our participants. Anthony uh, would like to ask um, a question. Anthony, would you like to go ahead? Okay, hi, Dr. Stone. Hi there. All right. Um, basically, I've been diagnosed with um, FND for under three years now. And um, the problem that I've experienced is this happened as a result of an accident. Um, and the accident had three impacts. Um, I had a concussion where I hit the back of my head. Um, the second part is where I fell from a standing position. Um, with a metal part into my lumbar area, yeah. which then resulted in me having um, been having my neck compressed against the wall. Um, okay. so, so a back injury and a head injury. Yeah. Back injury, yeah, um, head injury. Okay. And as a result of that, I've had a multitude of 
um, symptoms, um, yep. myoclonus seizures, um, cognitive um, yep. ch um, challenges, um, visual yep. the tinnitus. Um, um, but it seems as if what I've had is the focus has been on the neurological side, um, the musculoskeletal um, struggles that I have with my posture, standing, sitting, sleeping, um, seems to be overlooked. Um, I've, insomnia, I've had insomnia. Sorry, um, Do you have a general question just, just to bring yeah. this out for, the, for, yeah. for everyone? Yeah. Sorry, basically what, what I'm trying to find out is, is in regards to health professionals and how they assess that it is FND, if it's something that has resulted as a result, say in my situation, why do they, um, why do they not look at the full um, aspects that contributed to the accident as opposed to assuming that it's FNC, FND as a result of the, the scans from an MRI? Okay. And obviously, I can't, I can't talk about your individual case because I don't know all the details. And yeah. I think I can say in general terms that physical injuries and accidents are a very common trigger for FND and something I see a lot. Um, someone has a car accident, they have acute back pain. That acute back pain does something funny to their, and something, a combination of circumstances at the time of the accident trigger a change in their nervous system. So although there may have been you know, in commonly soft tissue injuries uh, which should have healed or settled down within a few weeks, the person's still left with symptoms years later. That's a very common scenario. And usually what you're looking at there is a mixture of chronic pain problems as well as uh, more neurological symptoms like weakness and tremor and things like that. Um, so you need a sort of pain diagnosis, really, as well as a FND diagnosis, although actually they're all part of the same condition, usually. Most patients in that scenario, chronic pain is, is occurring not because of ongoing tissue damage but, or musculoskeletal problems or discs or anything like that. It's usually occurring because the injury has turned volume knobs up on the pain pathways. And those volume knobs after acute injury normally get turned down but in, a, in patients with chronic pain, the volume knobs get stuck at, the, stuck at a high volume. So the person continues to experience continuous pain. That in turn leads to muscle spasm and altered posture, which in turn makes other symptoms worse. So it all becomes a vicious circle. So that's, that's the kind of formulation that many patients need in that situation. And sometimes when they've had a bad accident, that's also had a psychological impact as well. And many people have post-traumatic stress psychological symptoms after accidents which then also make things worse although not everyone so i hope that i hope that helps in a sort of generic way talking okay about thank you i appreciate that thank you we have another question um let's see andrew did you want to ask your question hi andrew hi, hi andrew. there Go ahead and ask the question. Sure. As my partner has been given many different medications by her GP, um, because I don't think the GP fully understands um, the condition that she's got, um, it's quite difficult to uh, it's quite difficult to work out what are the symptoms of the medications or what are the symptoms of FND, you know, yeah. whether it's withdrawal or sensitivity to medications. And I just wondered whether she should think about coming off these medications um, in order to try and ascertain whether it is FND or whether it's actually the medications that are causing the problem? Yeah, no, well, I think, obviously I can't answer that in your wife's case. I don't know what her situation is or what the medications are for. Sure. It is, it is very important to ask you, you know, maybe make an appointment with your GP to, say, to go through the medications, say what are all these medications for that you're taking? I think there is a, the medication can be helpful in FND, particularly if, if you have FND and you very clearly have, for example, uh, a lot of problems with um, 
chronic pain and you can't sleep, there are medications that can help that a bit. Uh, if you have a severe anxiety or severe depression, some medications can help that. My own view is that medications have a, quite a limited role in these conditions. And there are risks of medication, as you point out, that they can have side effects and they can make FND a bit worse sometimes as well. Mm -hmm. um, medica patients end up on lots of medication for lots of reasons. Sometimes they, you know, they go to their doctor desperate for help in pain, stress, and a medication is given, you know, because people, that's, that's what happens in that situation. It isn't always the right thing to do. It's sometimes much harder to not give a medication or reduce it. Um, I think I would make a particular comment that uh, opiate medications like tramadol and morphine are often given for, I know, perfectly good reasons, but I'm not sure, I don't think there's good evidence for their use in the sort of chronic pain states that commonly go along with FND. Now, please, anyone listening, don't change your medication just because of what I'm saying here. But I think it's worth thinking, is this medication really helping me at this point? Um, but but don't, don't suddenly stop any medication. It could be dangerous. Just talk to, about, talk to that with, about with the doctor. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that. And I, a really good point about medication because it, it really can be contributing to some of the symptoms, but it's also important that patients do discuss that with their medical health professional because coming on and off of medication can be extremely dangerous. And so we just want to again remind people to, um, to, to do that with the advisement of their physician. Yeah, definitely. It's not a black and white thing. I, I, I start medication, I stop it, you know, I think uh, it can be helpful, it can be harmful. Well, and some medication that started out helpful maybe isn't anymore. And yeah. so, you know, I think it's always important to look and see, you know, is this medication really helping and have that discussion with your healthcare provider. Another question that we have uh, from Ashley, uh, what do you, um, what do you do until you can get help from a specialist? I still have to wait another month for treatment. Uh, this has been obviously very affecting their lives immensely. And um, they've also been told there's nothing else they can do and they're not progressing without professional help. Yeah, it, it sort of depends. The answer to that depends what stage you're at because I know for many people, the stage they're at is that they don't really know what they have wrong. And they're not sure if they have FND or not. Um, and there it's very difficult, I think, you, because you need someone to be able to explain to you why it is FND and to give you that basis for treatment. If, you've, if you're confident you do have FND and you just want to get on and try and improve it, um, then you are, and you've not got anyone to help, uh, I mean, you would, I would hope you have your primary care physician. You may not know a great deal about it, but can maybe try and help you find out more. There's all the information on your website, on the FND Hope website uh, and others and mine, which is a starting point, but um, I appreciate it on its own may not be enough. But, I, but that looking at these sort of recognized sites is, a, is hopefully a starting point. And looking around to see if you've got, if there are stories, uh, sites all have stories of patients with similar see if you can find a story that matches your symptoms and see if you can get any any information from that that might that might help it does it sounds like a bit of a feeble answer i think the answer is you need to you know for these disorders usually people need professional they need professional help because they're complicated and everyone's different as well everyone needs their own to understand how they how the fnd is affecting them and how it fits in with their risk factors which vary a lot i'm trying to kind of lump we have several questions that are quite similar and so i'm trying to kind of lump a few of them together uh the one of the questions is after being diagnosed last year with symptoms um have, the symptoms have changed but once fnd is mentioned then everything is put down to this without investigation and i think as we talk about the many various symptoms that can be uh, part of FND. Uh, I think patients are always wondering, is this the FND or not? And then I think medical professionals are wondering, is this the FND or not? Yeah. 
what <clears throat> advice can you give to patients feeling like? Well, I think um, it is, yeah, so definitely, I, 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 I see the, I understand the problem and it's actually a problem faced, it's not just faced by people with FND. Uh, my patients with multiple sclerosis, for example, also feel like that. They, every time they have a symptom, someone says, oh, that's just your MS, you know. And they're thinking, is it, you know, are you sure? You're not sure I've missed something? Um, the answer is that when you, if, if someone gets a completely new symptom, then it should be evaluated by somebody. Uh, and it may have to be the neurologist again, because the, if it's a neurological symptom, for example, uh, if someone has never had a spasm in their face before and then they get one or they never had a seizure before, someone needs to look at that. I'd say the chances are, if you, or if you already have other FND symptoms and you get a new neurological symptom, the chances are it will be uh, FND, but it might not be. Um, people get carpal tunnel, they get uh, other you know, things like migraine, which uh, have other treatments. Um, so it's a case of finding some sort of balance there where you as a patient, I think you, when you have this condition, you do have to half expect new things to happen and to have relapses and it's one of the miserable things about it is that it's kind of unpredictable and so many different symptoms can arise and if you but if you half expect that it's kind of easier to cope with but at the same time you need to be able to rely on somebody who's going to be able to evaluate things openly and uh without prejudice if you like not so easy to find symptoms... sorry with symptoms such as tachycardia, uh, with like a heart rate of over 120, even when you're sleeping, would that be a sign of FND? Um, well, so in my, yeah, I mean, that's an example of a symptom that probably is of, linked to FND. Now, a fast heart rate is not specifically defined within FND. Uh, patients with FND have lots of symptoms that, but FND really just describes motor sensory symptoms and seizures. That includes things like vision, uh, weakness, tremor, blackouts. But we know from lots of studies that patients who have FND have a wide variety of other symptoms. So fatigue, pain, sleep, irritable bowel type symptoms, bladder, uh, palpitations, very common. And uh, my cardiology colleagues tell me that fast heart rates, palpitations, when they're referred patients, they very rarely find um, serious problems, but of course sometimes they do. Uh, but I would say fast heart rate, that is quite common in FND. But if you have a, it's not for me to say whether your fast heart rate is part of your condition, but it could well be is the answer. So is it common for people to have symptoms while they're sleeping? I know a lot, of, Patients will often talk about, well, I had a seizure in my sleep or other movements. Uh, is that a common situation or is that maybe something that should be kind of like, a, uh, since it was in your sleep, we maybe should go ahead and look at that a little bit further or ex you know, explore it a little bit more? Well, I think, I think you should have that caution for daytime symptoms as well, if they're different. But the answer is yeah, symptom, FND symptoms do happen a lot during sleep. So, for example, it was thought that seizures during sleep were unusual. Um, but in fact, plenty of studies have looked at that and shown that people do have their dissociative seizures when they're apparently asleep. Certainly from the patient's point of view, it feels as if they're asleep. When you record them, in fact, what's happening is that people wake up uh, or their brain waves turn into a sort of waking brain wave and then they go into a seizure and then they, they come out of the seizure and it, they, they have no memory of having woken up so it feels as if they're asleep and it looks as if they're asleep. Um, so FND arising from deep sleep actually is, is unusual but you really need to be recording that to, to know that. Uh, people have all sorts of symptoms. I mean, sleep is a very important thing to look at. Sleep quality is often poor in FND. There are other reasons for that. Things like obstructive sleep apnea which has a specific treatment. Uh, people have a lot of jerks. Limb jerking at night is quite common in FND. That's common anyway. It comes more so in FND. So um, I could go on and on about the problems. I, I better not. 
<laughs> yeah, people think for someone who knows about sleep and sleep problems to talk. I mean, this is this is an area of, of, of should be an area of neurological expertise to discuss. Right. Well, and we have found that there seems to be some kind of connections with sleep and lack of sleep, too much sleep. And, yeah. and there has been some research, a little bit of research being done in that area specifically for FND. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that it is, you know, along with so many other things, just another avenue that we need to look at. Uh, another question, I think we've got about five or six questions all dealing with B12, uh, varying from a patient that has received B12 shots and now a lot of their functional symptoms have gone away or have gotten have lessened. Um, when let's see, gentleman asks, I've noticed that since being in the group that lots of people with FND also have fibromyalgia and B12 deficiency, um, as in my case, why is it common for this to happen? Uh, wh what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, any, any neurologist, even a trainee one, ought to know that low B12, you should always be thinking about B12 when people have neurological symptoms, particularly uh, numbness, unsteadiness. Um, and that's, that should be just the routine thing to look at. Low B12 doesn't cause all neurological symptoms. It doesn't cause seizures, for example. Uh, I think where things are, get difficult is that there is a group, I'm aware that there's, there's a sort of group of particularly patients and some health professionals as well talk, questioning whether the reference ranges are correct and whether you can get effects of low B12 uh, or B12 deficiency within the normal range. Um, I know there's quite a lot of controversy about that. I, I think it's reasonable to have some B12 if there's any doubt about it. But I would go back to the I'll go back to the to the point about diagnosis, which is that you don't diagnose FND uh, on the basis of just the test being normal. It's it's you've got to have these positive signs. And so if someone's got a positive feature of functional leg weakness, that's what they've got. And they may have a low B12 as well, and you want to treat that. They may have uh, fibromyalgia. Um, they may even have a neurological disease uh, process like MS as well as a function as FND. That's quite common. Um, you can make these multiple diagnoses. I'm not. Sh I'm not aware of any epidemiological evidence to that says that B12 is deficiency is particularly common in a range of functional disorders like FND and fibromyalgia. But I think a low B12 could trigger be a trigger for FND in some cases, which is why you sometimes see the association. Thank you. We did, uh, we, did, we did notice in a lot of our groups that there is a tendency, and as you mentioned, there's not anything scientific by any means to, to prove that, but we did find that a lot of our members do tend to have a higher rate than the average. Um, we have another question now here by um, Lou. Would you like to go ahead and ask your question quickly? Yeah, thanks. It's just that um, I get daily prolonged seizures and um, dissociative seizures, but they're really painful. So should I have a medi tag that says, can I get pain uh, relief administered to me? Because it is quite very painful. I've broken bones so I can compare the level of pain and because obviously I can't speak and I can't do anything. And if my husband is present, should he say, look, give her pain relief because she is in actually a lot of pain? I think it's a tricky one. I have to, we have to talk generically here, Lou, because we know each other and I don't want to yeah. be, be talking about your particular seizures. No, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I think, I think seizures... Many patients, particularly, if, I mean, some, you know, most patients are not aware during their seizures, but they come round and they're in pain and they have a headache and they feel terrible. Uh, some people are in pain and are aware during them. And, um, and I know that's the case. Um, I think you have to, is, is a, there's a difficult balancing act with pain medication because uh, there's a downside potentially to pain medications. Well, I'm not sure it works that well either even if people have strong medicine like uh, benzodiazepines or opiates, and there's huge risks attached to, to those. So you have to weigh those things up and in, in, the, in the individual. I don't think there's a simple answer. Obviously, you want to try and relieve distress wherever possible, 
I think for the pain that goes along with FND, I think p many patients find it hard to believe that we don't just have answers for this. You know, we don't have drugs that take this away. In the 20, you know, we're here, here we are in 2017. Why haven't we got drugs that take pain away? Yeah. And the answer is we don't. We, our drugs for pain, particularly in this sort of chronic pain or these acute uh, distressing pain situations, are really poor, I think. And um, I know it's a big disappointment for everyone to hear that, but knowing that, I think, and, and changing your expectations of what's possible um, can, can help. So not a, not a very helpful answer, maybe, but um, perhaps, yeah, perhaps a sort of realistic one. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Our next question is from Emmett. Uh, diagnosed with multiple multiple symptom atrophy terminal for four years. Uh, now yep. re-diagnosed with FND. Uh, we yep. actually, this is also common that we hear, not necessarily that diagnosis, but just other ailments and then being re-diagnosed. How do you talk to your family and others after that type of change, you know, in diagnosis? Yep. It's a really difficult one, and I really have a, I really feel for that person because, so they're talking about MSA, which is a type of, uh, or rarer type of Parkinson's type of disease, and as you, the person said, usually it's um, limited life expectancy. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, it's it's very difficult with feelings of when when you're given a diagnosis, it very quickly. And it shouldn't, but it does. It becomes part of your identity. So uh, whether you like it or not, I think, you know, if you get epilepsy or MS, you become, I would become John with MS or, you know, and it's, it's one, one tries to avoid that, but it does become it, but become part of you. And then when someone says, actually, we were wrong, there's a whole load of things happen. First of all, you think, how could you, you people feel very angry that the diagnosis was wrong? And they were told that they feel guilty. They feel that they've been telling people a lie, you know, even though they shouldn't feel guilty. Mm -hmm. um, and I sometimes, if I'm trying to explain this to doctors, I say, well, it's a bit like if you said, if someone came up to me and said, John, you're actually not a neurologist. We've, had made a, we've made a mistake. You know, your, your exam was, your, your certificate's all wrong. And you're actually, you know, you're a, uh, I don't know, a surgeon or something else that you didn't think you were. Um, it might not necessarily be any worse, it's just different. And I would be very disturbed by that feeling uh, of, of not being the person or not having the condition I thought I had. So it's a, I think that person needs a lot of time to get used to their new diagnosis. It's much better to have FND than it is to have F MSA overall, although M FND can be just as awful as MSA, but at least it has the potential for improvement. Um, I have patients like that who've been, you know, they've been really, really pleased to receive a new diagnosis, but also felt very angry and uh, with the fact that it wasn't considered in the first place. This is one of the things I'm, I'm quite keen to get across to neurologists that they have, because you know, neurologists are usually worried about making the, making the error in the other way. They, they sort of don't want to miss what they see as a disease in someone with, uh, and, and, and call it a functional disorder, but it's, it's, it's bad to make an error whichever direction you do it, and it harms people. So, so all the best I, for that. I think another thing to kind of keep in mind is that, you know, the, the patient really, despite whatever diagnosis they got, that, that level of disability or suffering, you know, that part didn't change, even though the didn't diagnosis change. did. The same, it's the same symptoms and disability. So there's no need to be guilty uh, or feel that they're having a lesser condition diagnosed. Ultimately, what I hope happens, and I, have to, I go through this a lot with patients, is that they initially they feel very upset that they're having what they perceive as a genuine diagnosis taken away and they've been giving this thing that people haven't heard of and can't see it on a scan. Is that even a real thing? Uh, what, when it goes well, I had a lady recently who carried a diagnosis of MS for 10 years or longer. And I think she does have MS. But she, we, we were able to talk about the fact she also had FND. And she got to the point in physiotherapy where she was, the physio said, 
I think your ankle's a bit weak. I think that ankle weakness is your MS rather than your FND. And she was actually, she found herself being disappointed that it was the MS and not the FND. She was hoping that the ankle weakness was the FND. And we talked about how that, that was a good sign that she was, she was seeing her FND as a positive thing. It was something that had the potential for improvement uh, rather than that people's initial reaction, which is, what is this thing? You know, is it, is it even a real thing? And I think that's a great place to end off is that FND is a real illness and the, the disability, the, you know, other issues that come with relationships and, you know, parenting and all the other things that come with being chronically ill are the same for MS patients as they are with FND patients. And I think that it's important that we have these discussions and we really appreciate your time. And we've been over an hour uh, so we're going to have to wrap it up, but we, yep. we really appreciate the time that you're given to answer some of these questions. And we do have um, another date that we're kind of working on in next month. And so we will be announcing that. So if you didn't get your questions asked today, please do sign up for next time and we'll allow for some time to that, to take the other questions. So thank and, you. Uh, yeah. all great uh, well, thank you. It's always very interesting to uh, to hear the questions. They're always great. They're always great questions. They make me think about things as well. So thank you very much.